on his word. And what we have to do is we have to see what he says and we have to stand on what he says. We can't look at our circumstances. We can't look at us because most of the time your situations, oh, this, is, this should excite everybody in this room. Your situations that you're dealing with right now is the opposite of what God actually wants for your life. And so you should get excited and mad at the same time because you should tell your situation, you better stop lying to me. You, you're, you're, you're lying to me. Yes, this is hard. Yes, this is frustrating. Yes, it doesn't seem like it's going to ever end. But, but, but my God says that he will supply all of my needs. My God says that, that he watches over his word to perform it. So if he watches over his word, I have to stand and believe his word. I have to trust in his word. Because what his word told me is completely opposite of what I'm looking at right now. And so let me focus more on what he says versus what I'm seeing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so he exalts the house through your actions. After he gives you the vision, after he, after he gives you the promise, he gives you the vision, he gives you the word. And once he gives you the word, now it's up to you to carry it out. Amen. You do have a part to play in it. It's up to you to carry it out. You have to walk it out. Because what he does is he shows you the end, and then he sets you back at the starting line. All of us, I know, we all want to get to the finish line. But you got to start first. Because you know at the finish line... The one who crosses the finish line in a, in a regular race, a normal race, the one who crosses the finish line first wins. But in the kingdom of God, it's not that way. It's who all, whoever crosses the finish line wins. So we were kind of talking about this yesterday, kind of joking about this. Me, Pastor Dexter, Pastor Jeanette, Pastor Samuel, Pastor Deanna, and, and Angel. We were all talking, we were talking about dads versus moms how they raise their sons and how dads are harder on their sons than moms and how moms are harder on their daughters than the dads. The dads, the daughters have the dad wrapped around their finger. The sons have mama wrapped around their finger, but dad is super hard on the son. And we were talking about, there's no such thing as a participation trophy. I don't want my son getting no participation trophy. My son going to win. If he don't win, he don't need a trophy. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Period. And Angel was like, there's nothing wrong with second place. I said, who remembers second place? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. But now God has convicted me since I've been standing here talking to y'all. God gives us a participation trophy. Wow. Because when we participate, we all win. Yeah. We all get rewarded. We all get the award because we participate. But I'm still not going to let my son get no participation. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, but we get rewarded when we all start to do what God has called us to do. When we walk towards what he's called us to walk towards, he rewards us. He honors that. Because the Bible says faith without works is dead. So it does you no good to stand at the starting line and never move. That's what just happened to my son, my three-year-old son, this past weekend. I was mad at him because we had our Labor Day family reunion. And I got, y'all know, I got a huge family. On my mom's side, we went out there. Everybody's out there. We have all of these competitions. We have all of these races, sack races, two-legged races, all of these different things we have. I said, uh-oh, my son is ready now. He's three years old. He's ready to go take the crown. <laughs> and I, I had just drove up because I came from Arkansas to Oklahoma. I had just drove up, and they were lining the three- to five-year-olds up on the line. I said, uh-oh, wait, hold on, hold on, wait. Wait. Wait, the champ is here. Wait, hold on. Hold on. And one of my other cousins' son was standing away from the starting line. He wasn't at the starting line. So I didn't see him. So what I do, I set my son in front of him on the starting line. 
And my, my cousin's like, what are you doing? You set your son in front of my son. I said, oh, I didn't see him. My bad. I had winning on my mind. I didn't see him. He better get in position. He wasn't in position, so he got overlooked. And so I set my son there, and I coached him. I said, all right, when they said on your mark, get set, go. I said, you better run and run hard. And he's like, okay. And I said, all right, Josiah, you got me? When they say on your mark, get set, go, run. He said, okay. I was like, all right, yeah, we got this. We got this because, you know, he been doing it at home. So I knew he understood. Well, they said on your mark, get set, go. Everybody took off. And I'm like, run, Josiah, run, Josiah, run, Josiah. Everybody crossed the finish line. Josiah was standing at the start line doing this. Dude, what are you doing? You were supposed to run. You said, okay, I got it. Okay, I understand. But you didn't run. Isn't this what we do in the church? We jump, we shout, we say, God, I got it. And then we go back out in life and we just stand there and say, why? Why me, Lord? Why? Why are these bills overtaking me? God, why, why did the doctor give me this diagnosis? Why, Lord? And we're standing at the, at the starting point. When we got the instructions. And we said we understood the instructions. But at the end of it, if we don't ever run, we won't win. So we got to run the race that's been set before us. We have to move. We have to go. Because your family is anointed to win. I don't care what family you come from. I don't care what the background is. You were created to win. And a lot of us, when we, when we tend to think about our family, we think about all the, the main thing we tend to focus on is the negativity in our family. We tend to focus on all the hang-ups and the thing what we like to do, especially when we've kind of come out of it and come into some, 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 some spheres of, affluence and, and some, some fears of success, we tend to try to forget about our family. We tend to try to push them to the side. We tend to try to disconnect ourselves from them because of all of the negative things that we can remember and all of the negative things that we recall to our minds that we say we don't want. And God placed you in that family for a reason. You might be the one that's supposed to be the difference maker. You might be the one that's supposed to, del to deliver yeah. your family, Moses. Yeah. 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 You might be that very one. I, I said this back home. I'm not going to say it here, but uh, I'll tell y'all what I said, but I'm not going to say it the way I said it there. Um, I said, everybody got that drunk uncle and that crazy aunt in their family. Everybody got it. Some of you might have more than others. <laughs> but what I said there that I'm not going to say here is if you don't think you had that crazy aunt, you might be the one, but I ain't going to say that here. <laughs> you, 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 I'm not going to say that here. I won't say that because, you know, to most of y'all, I'm, I'm a guest, so I'm not going to say that. But, but we all got somebody in the family, are we all have some things in our family that we're not proud of. Come on. Bro, help me out. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to point you out, Ruby. Help me out. You, you, know, you know when you, when you was going to bring, bring her home to meet the family, you know, you, you got to thinking about some things, like you, and then you try to prep her for some things. <laughs> you, am, I, am I lying? I'm right. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. You, you prep now. Now, this person, you might want to. Now, now, this might be. Now, you, you prep them. <laughs> you, you tell them to get ready. Because there are some things that you're not proud of. But the thing that I've learned over the years, coming from the family I come from, because like I told y'all before, I got a huge family on both sides. And my family on both sides are so anointed. But the thing that, that, that tends to plague a lot of my family's mind is the negativity. 
and I, and, I, and, I, and I was involved in that as well a little further back when I first came into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I tended, I tended, tended to look down on some of the things I was taught. And it not only made me look down on it, it made me angry. And I was like, man, that wasn't right. Man, that was wrong. Why did they say, why did they do this? And, 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 it, and it made me angry. But I was angry at the wrong person. I was angry at the wrong thing. My grandma, who's 90 years old, she was my pastor all while I was growing up. And my grandma taught me a lot. She taught me pretty much everything I know when it comes to walking with God, living for God, uh, doing the things that God has called you to do. She taught me about hell. She taught me about, about heaven and hell, but she taught me that if you are sinning and you living in sin, you're going to hell. And I mean, she was strong on that, and to this day, she's still strong on that. I tell the story, we couldn't even play Uno in our house. We was gambling. That's teaching you how to gamble. We couldn't do none of that stuff. I mean, strict. But then when I came into the understanding of, of, of a little bit more, I got angry. But I was angry at the wrong thing. Because I learned some things. I learned not only about, you know, heaven and hell, but I learned about grace and mercy. And I learned about forgiveness. I learned about love. I learned about joy. I learned about peace. You know, I learned all of this stuff that I didn't really hear. Not that she didn't display it. Because she loved, she loved, she, she, to this day, you would hear her say, God, she, her desire is to be the mother of the world. All of the abandoned babies, all of the orphans, and, and all this, she, she, her desire is to be the mother of all of those babies. Because she doesn't want to see any baby lost, want, don't want to see anybody hurt. She, that, that's, that's her heart. But then when I learned all this other stuff, it's like, you didn't teach me this. And it was, and it's so easy to look down on her. But what she did for me is she laid the foundation. She laid the foundation. And that's what happens in our family. There's a foundation that's been laid, and you're the one that's supposed to build on that foundation. So I, I love learning about my family, and I love understanding the family of knowing it. Now, in my family, on my dad's side, almost everybody can sing. I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't get that family anointing. They, they, the first thing they say, they say, you're lame? Oh, you can sing. I was like, no, not this one. I just preach. Now, I try to sing, and I only really try to sing is when I'm under the, the anointing. But I love to sing, but I can't sing. I'm not going to be your guest vocalist. <laughs> you're not going to come and ask me to come sing for you. That's not my anointing. That's not my gifting. <laughs> but everyone, everyone knows my family in that capacity on the lane side. On the walker side, it's just a family of love and, 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 and hospitality. And, and, and like the Labor Day weekend, it don't, it's not just our family that's out there anymore. They, they all grew up with this a, a little area in the country called Cane Creek. And they invite all the families from Cane Creek to come to this Labor Day weekend now. Since my grandma and my grandpa passed on, it's like, hey, let's just make it a Cane Creek family reunion. And it's, it's beautiful. There's hundreds of people out there. And when we're out there, it's all out on my grandma and grandpa's property. And they're having all of these different activities. They, they do even do an auction where they're auctioning off different things. They auctioned off one of my aunt's cakes for like $140. One of my uncle's cakes because my grandma had a bacon anointing. And it was passed down. I, I got a little bit of that now. Now, I can bake. Don't get it twisted. I can bake. I can cook. I can grill. I can grill some. I can cook whatever you tell me to cook. I can put it together. That anointing was passed down. I ain't bragging. It's just the anointing that's on my life. I'm telling you. It's on my life. But, 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 but what, what, what I've learned and what I've appreciated with my, my family on my mom's side is that how they brought other families together. And when I walked out there the other day, I was like, man, I don't know half these people out here. But it was a beautiful thing because it brought people together. And everybody had smiles on their faces. And they might be going through I don't know what. 
But, but for that moment, my family was being used to bring some happiness and to bring some, some good memories to their mind. So understand that what God has placed on the inside of you, the anointing that God has placed on the inside of you and, 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 and on your family, if it's not what you want it to be, it's what he's told you you're supposed to make it be because he put it in you. You're supposed to build on that foundation. So 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is when the ark, when, when, when David and, and, and all of his men, they were carrying the ark. Um, in, in verse 11, it says, The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. Now, why? I'm going I'm to I'm rewind real quick. Why was the, the ark in the house of Obed-Edom? The reason why is because Uzzah was killed for touching the ark. He touched the ark. The ark was the covenant of God. You weren't supposed to touch it. The Levites especially wasn't supposed to touch it. Well, other just took it upon themselves like, hey, it's about to fall, so let me go ahead and put my hand on it and hold it there to make sure it don't fall. And God struck him dead because he disobeyed, and he, and, he, and he made the ark something common. He didn't reverence it. And so what happened, David got fearful. He got mad, and then he got fearful. And he's like, no, nah, that's not going to my house. I don't want it. So let's, let's just go ahead and send it to Obed Edom's house. Let's just let, let, let him have it. Let him hold on to it. I'm good. I don't need it in my house. If it's killing folks like that, I don't need it. And so he did, did away with it. And so it stayed in his house for three months. And then what happened? The Lord blessed Obed Edom's house and his entire, Obed Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told about it. Hey, you remember old Obed? You remember that, that ark? My well, man, his house is blowing up. He's successful. His business is booming. His family is exploding. Everything is happening. Man, his bank account is, uh, bank account is fat. Everything is just, just lovely in Obed Edom's house. So David was like, hold up. Wait. I'm supposed to have that. So then it said, the Lord... Has, has, has blessed Obed Edom's house, household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. And so, so he, he's like, hey, that blessing was supposed to be mine. So let me go ahead and go back and get that like I'm supposed to and let me bring it to where it belongs. And David came in dancing and singing, and everybody was rejoicing and having a good time because now he's brought the ark back to where it belonged. And so this is the thing we have to understand. Sometimes the very thing that's supposed to bless you, it, 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 could, it could harm others. But then on the other side, because you're not being obedient and doing what God told you to do with it, it can go to somebody else and bless them. And you're looking at it, I, I, I'm, I'm still kicking myself because I had an invention about 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that right there. And I looked into it, I researched it, and I was like, man, nobody's got this, nobody's done this. And do you not know I seen an infomercial about three or four months ago that somebody got the very invention that I was trying to put out there? I was like, I missed it. I missed it. And it was something simple. Something simple. I, I, athletes, y'all, y'all know. Anybody been an athlete? You're an athlete. You, you, you know. You, yeah. You know. When them knees get to aching, you gotta ice them. You gotta put that ice on those knees. Gotta get this big ace bandage and just wrap it around, wrap it around. I said, why not get knee braces and you can make a pouch and just put ice in the knee brace? It's simple. It's simple. And I didn't do nothing with it. And now I see they got ice braces that you can put ice in. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I missed out on millions. It, he gave it to somebody else. Because I chose not to do nothing with it. Because I was afraid of it. I was afraid that it was just too simple and that, that, that nobody would really buy into it. 
And that's what David did. David was like, no, no, no I don't want that. But then he said, oh, they, they're being blessed. Oh, let me go back and get it. So I'm going to tell y'all now, since, since I didn't get to do it, y'all better go back and get what God has given you. Go back and get it. Because it's blessing others. Go back and get what God has blessed, blessed you with, what he gave you, the download that he gave you. Go back and revisit it. Go back and revisit it and watch what happens. You're going to come back singing and dancing and skipping. Because now you know that the blessing is back in your house the way it was intended to be. Hallelujah. So let's move on real quick. So what are you going to do with the blessing that God has blessed you with? What are you going to do with it? Let's go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And this is where we're going to land and this is where, where I'm going to close out. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And it says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. I want to stop right there. Because a lot of times we, 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 we tend to, you know, speed past the Holy Spirit. And we, we don't really think he's relevant in today's time. Because of what we were raised around and what we were taught. You know, we thought the Holy Spirit was somebody that made you just follow a pews and, and made you just foam at the mouth and buck and shout and just act crazy and be just real, you know, that, that's, that, I'm, not, I'm not discounting that. I'm not discrediting that. But I'm saying, you know, a lot of times when you saw that, when you went outside of the church, that very person you saw bucking and shouting was the one that cussed you out. So you had a, 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 a real terrible view of what the Holy Spirit really was, how he really act and how he really respond. I, I, I'm telling on myself right now, but I, but I love li listening to nephew Tommy. But I hate when he calls church people. I love listening to his prank calls. Every time he prank call a, a church person, y'all notice what I'm saying, a church person. Oh my goodness. He called this one woman, and I mean, she was doing just fine for a little while. But it didn't take her no time to go from zero to 100. And she kept saying, ooh, Jesus, I'm trying. Ooh, Jesus, I'm trying. But then after that, it was bleep, 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 bleep. She, and then this is what she said. She said, she said, see, I'm trying to stay on the side of Jesus, but you done brought the other side out of me. But that other side's supposed to be dead. That other side's supposed to be buried and gone. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, what happens is, is that we don't really fully engage with the Holy Spirit, and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and direct us. So we allow ourselves to operate in our flesh. Uh -huh. And so, so the, the Bible says that God anointed Jesus. And we've been talking about the family anointing. He anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. And then it said, and with power. And I, man, I stopped on that. I said, wait, the Holy Spirit is power. But the more I researched it, the more I understood it. Mr. Craig, can you give me my illustration? The more I researched it, he said he, said, he anointed him. This, this is the thing you got to pay attention to, too. Also, it says Jesus of Nazareth. So he's basically talking about the man Jesus. He's talking about the man Jesus. And you can just sit it right there. And if you don't mind, give me, oh, that's going right there. I'll get that, that bottle of water. So he anointed, he anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the man, mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit. But then it says, and with power. Everybody in here, you're anointed. You're anointed. You have been anointed. You have been gifted in some capacity. You have been anointed to do what you do in some capacity. But he says, and with power. And then it says, then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. This represents us. We're the vessel. 
This right here represents the anointing. And God pours, pours into us a measure of the anointing. He pours into us a measure of the anointing. We only receive a measure when we're born into the family we're born in. We're born into the earth, period. Um, the family that we're born in. And then as we go through life, we, you know, kind of start discovering some of those things, some of those, those measures of anointing. We don't really fully understand and we don't fully engage in the, the totality of what God has called us to because we really don't have our true identity in him. And so, so we receive a measure. And when we receive this measure, we, I, we have to understand, and this is what blew my mind, and, I, and, I, and I'm hoping and praying that God reveals this to you so you can understand what it is that you're packing right now. And, and what this represents in us. So as we receive a measure, you know, for those of you, let me go ahead and just ask, because how many of you in here are spirit filled? Okay. Good. So, this is a measure. Now, this is the thing we got to understand. That back in the Old Testament, all they could receive was a measure. Because the Holy Spirit wasn't yet given. So, you know, the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And they would be able to perform miracles and do things as the Holy Spirit came upon them. But as the Holy Spirit came upon them... Once he left, it was over. It was done with. As they met others' needs, as they did, went around and doing what all God told them to do in those moments, in those seasons, the Holy Spirit just came upon them in those moments. And so they were filled with the Spirit. When Jesus came and anointed the disciples, they were filled with the Spirit. But they still was only limited. But they were operating in the spirit. They were coming back bragging. They said, man, even the demons are subject to us. But why did Jesus tell them after he left? He said, go and wait on the promise. They were doing all of these great things. But all of those great things that they were doing, they could only do it in those moments as the Holy Spirit came upon them to do it. So as they were filled, they were filled, they had limited power. But when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus was baptized. I'm going to overflow this because I put too much water in. It's messing up my illustration. Get it together. So as he was being baptized in it, not only was he filled, he was also immersed in the fullness of his power. He was also immersed in it. And when he came up, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the thing you have to understand is, is that Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18. Can you go there, go there real quick in Matthew 28, 18? In, this, in the New Living Translation, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth because he's baptized in it. Jesus of Nazareth, the man, the man, he said, I have to come down on earth to show you what you're capable of. I have to come down on earth to not only be empowered, but to empower you. I have to empower you to do what it is God has called you to do. So as you've been baptized in the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is, you're not only just, just being anointed, but you're also anointed with power. You have the power to do. You have the power to create. You have the power to change your situations with what you speak. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, the fig tree had to dry up and die because he spoke it. What are you speaking? What are you cursing? 
What are you focusing on that's, get, that's, that's taking all of your attention away from what it is you're supposed to be focused on? What has your attention? What has your mouth? What has your thinking? You have to be baptized and immersed in the power of who God called you to be. But Jesus said, I've given all this power. And then in verse uh, in Matthew 18, 18, he says, I tell you the truth, that whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you uh, permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. He said, the power that I have now, I give it over to you. Hallelujah. I give you that same power and that same authority. I give it to you. So that you can operate and you can move and you can do what I've called you to do. Now let me tell you, let me tell you real quick, real quick, what what the, that power represents. It represents authority. It represents freedom. It represents you having the ability, the ability to dominate every situation in your life. Even when it comes, even when it tries to attack, even when it tries to attach itself to you, you have the power, the authority, and the ability to, to annihilate anything that's not like God. He said, whatsoever things you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever things you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That means he's given the power and the authority to you. And what we don't do is we don't open our mouths and speak what the word says. We don't stand on his promises. We don't stand on what it is he called us to stand on. Yes, what we do is we start at the, the starting point, and then we look at the finish line, but then we see the hurdles. Yes, and we trip over the hurdles. Right. And then we might pull a hamstring, and we'll drop out of the race. Yes. I know some of y'all that's a little, little older. I don't know if y'all remember Ben Johnson when he pulled his hamstring. Um, he was running a race, and, and he was about to set a record, and he pulled a hamstring, and, and, and right there, coming around the last turn, he pulled his hamstring, and he just sat there, and he cried his eyes out because he knew he missed that moment. But what he didn't do, Toy, he didn't quit. He didn't quit. His dad, boy, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now. His dad came out of the stands. His dad ran down there to his side. And when his dad came and ran to his side, his dad grabbed him and said, come on, son, finish the race. Finish what you started. I know it hurt. I know it, it looks like it's over. I know it seems like that you won't get what you thought you were supposed to get. But right now in this moment, you have to finish the race. Right now in this moment, you have to complete what you started. The Bible says what I have started in you, I will complete it. And so he completed the race. All of, the, all of the, the medics and everybody came and tried to make him, no, stop, 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 lay down. The dad was like, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Move out of the way. He got somewhere to be. He got some things to do. He has to complete what he started. And so that's the thing you have to understand, family. You were created to complete what's been started. Don't get frustrated. It is frustrating. Don't get frustrated enough to where it makes you want to quit. Yeah. Although it makes you want to quit. Yeah. Don't quit. Yeah. Your daddy God is with you. Yeah. And he said, come on, daughter. Come on, son. Finish the race. Get up. Get up. Move. Stop wallowing in your mess. Stop, stop crying and, 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 and weeping and staying stuck in your bed. Cry and keep moving. Yeah. Scream and keep moving. Fight and keep moving. Whatever comes your way, fight. You are anointed to win. God is with you. He's given you power. You're not just filled. You're filled with not, not only the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. Power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Power to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Power to speak to the mountain and the mountain has to remove. Power. Wondrous working power has been given to us. So although your situation right now might not be ideal, and I know you're feeling it, mama. I know you're feeling it. Your situation might not be ideal, but you're a winner. 
you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through. You're an overcomer. You fought for a long time. You've been fighting. You feel like you're fighting all your life. And you say, God, when is it going to stop? He's making you into something great. And I'm going to speak this by the Spirit of God. Where you are right now, this time next year, you won't look nothing like what it looks like right now.